Um, I'm going to start with a question, and I'm going to be happy with microphones. Yes, um, I'm going to ask you when, we, when I turn to you after the first question, please wait for me to call on you, and then also please wait for a microphone. I hope I can see you all. Okay. Um, well, let me ask you this. Is, this. is this film finished? Obviously things are not finished. <laughs> Uh, the revolution's ongoing, mm -hmm. um, and oh, I think it is. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Be loud. I don't see it. Maybe hold it a little closer to me. Okay. Yeah. Um, like the revolution continues. It's ongoing, and all of the characters that we followed are still fighting. But we feel this film has ended. We've gotten it to a place where it can be shown ten years, fifty years from now and the emotional journey of the characters has come full circle. So that's where we decided to close it, rather than continuing to try to keep up with political events, which is absolutely impossible. Although, will you, I have a feeling you will be going back and there, there may be something else in a certain period of time. Well, it's the first film that I've ever worked on where you're continually, you know, I'm checking Facebook and I'm continually updating as things are changing, as we're editing it, and it's, it was an exciting but kind of crazy process, and um, I, I think if we're going to try to figure out some way of releasing it where we can give updates, short little pieces that we'll, we'll upload and do that kind of thing. So. In the back in the green, um, so let, do you see where I'm pointing? Thank you. The thousand pound gorilla in all this since 1952 is the Egyptian Armed Forces. I don't really get a sense from this film or other films I've seen what's going on with, in their ranks because they were through Morsi, they control 50% of the economy, they're the actor who's deciding the pace of the of events aside from the issues of legitimacy, so legitimacy that, you took, that you so interestingly explored. What's your take on that? on that whole question, because I've never seen a film so far in the revolution that explores any of this dimension. Well, first of all, in terms of access to the military, it was incredible that we got access to the two guys there. Um, one of them, the younger guy, was filmed by Ahmed, and um, there was no way we, I mean, it, was, it wasn't approved of or anything. So we're still sort of working on that. In terms of what's happening with the military, do you want to? Well, I mean, you know, as, as you mentioned, the military controls about 40% of the Egyptian GDP, and it is, you know, the state within the state. Um, I think that you have to go back to what the main battle cry of this revolution was, which was the people demand the downfall of the regime. The regime into Egyptians is the entire social structure, it's the entire um, separation of powers, I, uh, it's the entire uh, revision of the social contract, it's the entire uh, definition of dignity in society, and the military definitely has a role in, in that regime that people are trying to change. Now, you have to understand that Egyptians have a love for the military as well. The military is the most powerful institution in the country. It is, a, every single household has someone who's been in the military uh, because of mandatory conscription. And the military is also viewed by most Egyptians as one of the only places in the country where there is any kind of social advancement, any kind of meritocracy, where you can come in as a soldier and come up and rank and file. So, with that in mind, we have to differentiate between the military and the leaders of the military who are corrupt officials and who are, you know, destroying the economy and who are uh, promoting a kind of fascist state. And I think that what, where Egyptian youth have reached is the idea that they will continue to fight against fascism, whether it comes in the sense of military fascism, economic fascism, religious fascism through organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, however, they're unwilling to allow any group to own an institution. So Egyptians like Ahmed, for example, in our film, he you know, is unwilling to allow for um, the military to be owned by the corrupt. So if he's asked to join, he's going to join. He's joining the military because he's like, that's my military. That's not owned by these people. And if, and my, you know, boycotting it is my relinquishing my right. So 
it's a complex, you know, uh, idea uh, of the role of the military in Egypt, and it's something that's going to continue to be tested and pushed. That's the next film, Ahmed in the military. So we'll see what happens there, and maybe we'll have a better answer to the question once we have an insider to lead a revolution within the military. I'll be looking for that uh, over here first. Yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah. No, wait for the microphone. Oh, down here. Second row, right? Second row, right here. It's such a film. Thank you. At Sundance, you seem to run into the room for your Q&A directly from the editing room. And it's a very different story, a very different film from what we saw there. I'd like you to talk about the crafting of it, if I may, not ask a political question, but a storytelling. In this digital age of everyone can put something up on YouTube, you've managed to craft a film that is quite extraordinary in cinematic terms, and I'd like you to talk about how you balance the need to tell history with the need to t make a film in a film sense. Uh, thank you very much for the, um, the compliment on the question. Um, uh, when we finished for the first time, we allowed the film to end, or the film sort of allowed us to end it, was when Morsi was elected because finally there was a storyline from the bringing down of a, of a dictator to the election of a president. Um, but two weeks before we went to Sundance, um, all of our characters were back in the streets because he had claimed dictatorial powers and were, was rewriting the constitution. And we felt like this is a story that we have to continue making and shooting because it wasn't just a story about this political process, but it was more about the journey that these characters have gone on from the removal of one dictator to the demand to remove the next dictator. And that was more, that was about this, um, this journey that these characters were taking where they were basically saying, we will say no to fascism, whether the face of that is Mubarak, or the military, or the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, putting this together when everybody in the square had cameras, um, it was both a huge blessing because we had people that you know, wanted to give us footage that we were working with and we were providing footage for other people. A lot of times it felt like we were not only making a film, but we were, there were many times when our characters were long gone, but I had to stay for several more hours because I was the only camera in the square, and everybody said, you know, you're the only witness, you have to stay here. And this happened with all of our, all of the filmmakers on the project. Um, and we were editing, we were editing in an office that was five minutes away from the square. We had revolutionaries that would be chased out of the square and come sleep in our office. So, and we were editing it at the same time. So there was a lot of input, um, basically saying, you know, you can't remove this or that. It will destroy the story of the revolution. So it was a very intense process. And I, I guess in terms of crafting the story, we really had to take ourselves, we moved away from Egypt, and we had to look at what we had and decide this is what this has to be a film that is going to last for many many years, and it has to be the character's journey, and we have to pull ourselves away from the events. And that's when we really worked hard to create a, a film based on these characters' journeys. I just want to say you know, it was something amazing to because we all met we the whole team met each other in the square, and there was no pre-production on this project. And so we're there as protesters, and you know, Jahan was really able to, um, you know, in this mood where everybody just wanted to film everything happening, she was really able to uh, to, to, to push the, the, the idea of covering characters and not just documenting news. And it was very difficult because a lot of people wanted to just capture the moment, you know, and would get sidetracked with the, with the emotional truth of what's happening through a character. And, and I think it's because of you know, her uh, love and respect uh, for Cinema Verte, you know, and her experience in that, which came from someone in the audience who... I was just about to audience. say, actually, two people in the audience who I learned so much from, Chris Hedges and D.A. Pennebaker, who are here, 
who, um, who we made startup.com with, and Chris would always say, I don't care what happens. If it doesn't involve Tom and Khalil, who are characters that we are following, we just cannot keep filming other things. And you know, it, that's what you end up with. You end up, people need to be attached to character, and that's what you follow. So I kept trying to channel them to the many revolutionaries, channel Chris and Penny to all the revolutionaries in the square. And, and it's one of the things that's very difficult because there's so much interesting political action happening, and, and like the gentleman's question earlier, like the role of the military, the role of the intelligence, the role of the American embassy, and there's so much of that. But it's very difficult to capture that because it, it makes it much more of a, less of a character film and more of this like what happened in Egypt film. And I think that Jahan always tried to kind of, she, she, she doesn't try to claim that she has the account of what happened in Egypt, you know, that will tell you the inside backdoor deals. It's, you know, the only thing we can strive for is an emotional journey through people that we witnessed, and that's all that we can claim responsible for. You know, we don't have the, we're not the experts on the Egypt story. You know? yeah, and it is very interesting. I, I just remembered like years ago when the video cameras came out, I said, this is great, people can make documentaries and they'll be on the ground and have moment, but now we've, we've gotten to the point where there is so much, so much on the ground information from phones and everything so that your ability to actually create sort of, you know, this part of the story. Is, is something. Um, down here in the front row, can we get, oh. right here. Hi, uh, any quick update on how the civilians, the secular civilians, have self-organized at this point, and if there were an election in Egypt tomorrow, would they still be operating the vacuum between the sort of death grip between the military and the MD, or would they actually have something that would, that would shot in America? Um, there is a lot of organizing that's happening on the ground um, with, with uh, activists and many, many different groups. Um, we have to remember, though, that the, um, the ex-regime has been in power for uh, 50, 40 years um, and has people in every village of Egypt still. Um, and the Brotherhood have been operating underground for 70 years. Um, they have lost a huge, because of their year in power and what they did, they have lost a huge amount of support from the general Egyptian population. Um, and do I see anybody on the forefront right now from the community of people that we followed in the square? Right now there's nobody that is that, that I know of that's standing up. I think it's a process and I think it's going to take a long time. I, I think that without getting into the politics, uh, what's happening in Egypt is, is, is an attempt to break these binaries. You know, that, that's, it, it's an attempt between um, Egyptians don't want either of these, whether it's military or brotherhood. They're trying to redo, they're trying, what, as Ahmed says in the end, to develop a society of consciousness. They want to break beyond that. You know, what, and it's not about finding one leader, as Ahmed says. Because, so if people are trying to build a culture of what the democratic process in Egypt will look like. And there's a process to that, and we believe that Egypt needs to be able to breathe to find its own way. And what that way will look like won't be the Turkish model necessarily, won't be the American model, won't be the uh, you know, uh, Japanese model, it will be the Egyptian model. So Egyptian society has to come to terms with that. What we do know is that June 30th, what did happen, despite the debate on whether it was a coup or a revolution or this or that, what did happen is Egyptians rebalance the idea of the role of religion society by saying, by a quarter of the country's population coming down and saying, we don't want this. They didn't necessarily they want, they didn't say they wanted massacring of Muslim Brotherhood, and that's not what they wanted. But they did say, we don't want political powers using religion in our name. And that's a massive realignment of the whole role of society, which will have ramifications in the entire Muslim world. So, the role of religion. The role of religion in society. So the idea of like, what is this, where is separation of church and state? Egyptians have to come to that conclusion themselves through their own process. You know, and, and so the role of the military, the role of all these things will come in time. Um, I, I just want to look at the back. Yes, up there in the back, I think third from the back row. Yes, yes, you, yeah, raise your hand up so they can bring you the mic. Thank 
question. Uh, thank you for that excellent film. Um, I just wanted to know if there was an update on the young woman who we saw a lot of in the first two thirds of the film, but then I think after the hospital attack, she kind of vanished. So I was wondering if you know what happened to her, if you're worried about to know. Thank you. All of the characters had an interesting relationship with the square, and I think for Aida, at a certain point, she decided that her standing in the square was not doing as much as she felt like she could do doing other things. She's a filmmaker and an actress, and she has continued to make films. But our film was about the square and the people in and out of that square, and so we continued to follow. Um, but basically what she's doing now is she's acting, she's filmmaking, um, she was in a film uh, in, 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 by an Indian filmmaker, I recently I forget the name of it, but it, she won Best Actress at the Dubai Film Festival. And what was interesting is the part she played was a uh, uh, someone who was a film someone who was a filmmaker who had gone blind, who was slowly going blind, and the use of her camera in like uh, trying to capture what's happening or things around. Her. And it's been a difficult place for women as well. I mean, for a long time. She was in the square constantly. There were there started to be attacks on women at a certain point. She actually went back to be part of organizations that like uh, Tahrir Bodyguard, and she was part of a couple of organizations that were helping to make sure that women were protected in the square. And during one of those sort of rescues, she got attacked. So she's had a very difficult uh, time of it. But I mean, she's she's incredible, and she keeps she's. Uh, she continues to fight, she continues to be an extreme when she can now. Um, Rajya, the other character uh, who we see, um, the redhead, who is labeled by all in the square, the lioness in the square. I've known her since kindergarten, and she got me out of jail, um, and basically operates as this amazing human rights lawyer that gets, you know, 300 people a day out of jail. She's working all the time. She was just awarded the um, Robert Kennedy Human Rights uh, award, so she'll be the first Middle Eastern woman to receive that award. November. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, down here, front row, Brad. Yeah. Uh, two film making questions. When, at what point did you know you were going to go and start this process? And talk about the revelation. That I'm going to get into the middle of this. And then, were there at any point that you asked questions or um, you know, added, injected yourself into the process in terms of talking about civil society or any of these issues, or were, were all these conversations totally spontaneous? Because, I mean, there were things where I was wondering whether anyone was asking, you know, at what point were there questions being asked or not asked? Um, I, I made a film in 2007, which um, went on BBC and a number of other places called Egypt We're Watching You um, and it was about three women that were videotaping everything that was going on at the voting polls to show the corruption that was happening and using that as evidence um, and uh, so I was in contact with these women consistently and when Tunisia happened I, I was in and out of Egypt at the time my parents lived there I was lived 10 minutes away from the square grew up 10 minutes away from the square um, so when things were rumbling, Tunisia had happened, this January 25th was planned, I called people up, should I, you know, should I be there? Um, and uh, I actually got invited to Davos at the time, and I was thinking, do I go and do this little talk there, because then I'll have access to Gamal Mubarak and all of the leadership, so that if anything happens on the 25th, it'll be an interesting place to be because I'll be among the leadership of Egypt as this is happening. Um, and then none of them showed up because Egypt did it. But, so I was sitting there, you know, in Switzerland, like, I've got to get back to Egypt as soon as I can. So I got the first plane back. When I arrived, the army had already was already in the streets. I was stopped by military intelligence. I had brought back a number of DVDs of my last film from 2007. They saw that and immediately thought, okay, there's something wrong with this person because what is she doing bringing in 10 films that say Egypt were watching you as the country is exploding. I got taken into military intelligence, tried to shove a couple of DVDs down a drain, you know, so that they wouldn't <laughs> see them. Ultimately, they got all of them. I was questioned for eight hours and let go. So military intelligence now has seen that film. And, um, and then went directly to the square. And in the square was just 
I mean, I grew up in a country where people would not talk about politics. People were so scared to talk about what was going on. And also a country where there were huge barriers between classes, between people weren't across class, across religion, men, women. And I went into a square where for the first time I saw people communicating with each other with a hope about the future for their country that I had never seen in my life. And it was just the most incredible thing coming from seeing protest movements in New York against the Iraq war, I'd been a part of that, but nothing had really happened, and yet here were these people that if they got caught and put in jail, they could be in jail for the rest of their lives, or they could be killed. And they were, I just found this, this in, you know, being among, the, among these people was incredibly inspiring. Did I know it was a film? No, I just felt like, okay, I know that if you make a film, you have to follow characters as I said, learning from the legends of filmmaking behind you, Chris and Penny. And so I sort of started looking for characters and I found Ahmed, who was this incredibly charismatic guy. I met Megdi, the Muslim Brotherhood guy. I met Khalid in the square, all before Mubarak stepped down. Met the entire rest of the crew in the square. Um, so I met Kareem in the square. He was setting up a stage for, there was a Brotherhood stage, there was the lefty stage, and Kareem was setting up a stage where anybody could sit up, stand up and read a poem on. And he was also doing this online constitution thing where basically you could, it was sort of like crowdsourcing the constitution. We had a lot of wacky ideas. So, <laughs> I was like, you would be an interesting person to follow. I followed him for a few days and then he said, you know, I think you need more of a producer. You shouldn't be following me. So he became the producer and that's how the whole thing kind of came together. When did we really know it was a film? I, I think what happened was, the, minute, the, the time that I really knew it was when Rami was arrested, and here was this guy that was heralded as a hero of the revolution, and then three weeks after Mubarak steps down, he's dragged to the Egyptian museum and tortured, and there's not a word of it in the Egyptian press or anywhere. And that's when you start to feel, okay, we've got to keep filming this struggle because, you know, this is this, the world needs to see this. I, I think we, we, we do have to end, but there was one more question. If you could just quickly uh, uh, talk about the conversations that people have. Were they spontaneous? Were they at all oh. decided in advance? No, there was really nothing decided in advance. I mean, we follow people, and then if I had a, a curiosity about something, I asked a question. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was all... Um, you know, completely unscripted. Like there was no, there was no time to even do that if, if we wanted to, because it's not like you can plan where your characters are going to be. I mean, we sat down with Ahmed at the end of it, though. Yeah, we sat down with Ahmed at the end and asked him a series of questions, and that's the, that's the stylistic difference from the couple show at Sundance and now is that we asked him a number of questions because we felt like his voice leading us through the film was very important. Um, that is all we have time for for questions. Um, thank you very, very much.